Hello and welcome to Astro Psych 400. What you're about to hear is a segment from a live stream that came out last Thursday here on this channel. As always, you can like and subscribe, and remember that being weird is not a crime. However, I do a regular segment here on Astro Psych 400 that is called the Podcast for Sleep that helps people fall asleep at night. And I thought that this was a little bit different, so I'm introducing it as a different type of material, and just approach it any way you want. Maybe if you have something to say, share in the comment section down below, and feel free to tune in next week for a new podcast for sleep here. Fall asleep instantly, or at least as soon as possible. Let's have a listen. We would have the chance to go further and further with the possibilities of learning how we can compromise in relationships, and how they could bring about some type of benefit for us. But the overall goal that I want to share with you is that the dominant person moves the relationship to their advantage, and you need to be aware of that. Is somebody just simply being so disagreeable and refusing to cooperate and participate with you that you even begin to wonder, why is this person around at all? And there was this show out there called Yo, is this racist? I know. Beautiful name, right? And it was hosted by uh, two people. One of them was named Andrew. And he made the bold statement that I live by to this day. If there is even one single thing that you do not like about the person, you don't have to stay friends with them. Nope. You don't have to maintain a friendship with somebody that you don't like. And I think that that is just a very honest part of reality that we all need to explore. You don't have to maintain a friendship with somebody you don't like. And the reasons why people would do that would be they get pulled in to this world of, um, as I said, agreeableness, always going along with it, and then it'll actually feel like physical sickness if they have to stand up to the person who's been mistreating them. And I think that that is purely related to realizing that You've allowed someone to mistreat you for so long that you don't want to do that anymore. So the next point um, on this list that I wanted to talk about of ways that people will try and manipulate you is through kindness. Kill them with kindness, right? You ever heard that expression? Well, it's very real. Absolutely, it is very real. And killing with kindness is um, something that people do that is very manipulative, but they aren't aware that they are trying to be manipulative. No. The way that they're doing this is they think that they're just being nice and polite and fair and honest, but what they aren't doing is empathizing. Not once is this conventionally nice or kind person asking, well, how does the other person feel about it? How does the other person feel about the behavior in which he or she or they is expressing? And I honestly think that that is something that is just not included in their particular equation because they have it in their mind that this is conventionally nice behavior, therefore it is good. But the problem is, it's lacking empathy. And the problem is that They aren't recognizing when their behavior is bothering other people. They just keep telling themselves over and over again, this is good because it's conventionally good. It's good to give people compliments. It's good to smile light and brightly at people. It's good to um, say, good morning. Oh, you're looking so nice today. And to talk in some type of gentle and floaty and light and airy voice. And they tell themselves this over and over again. But what it leads to is a lack of social awareness. And then when other people criticize them, they just turn it around on the people who are criticizing them. No, they're only doing it because they're mean, and they don't want to give up their their mean behavior. They don't want to give up their ability to do bad things. But I think that at a certain point in adulthood, we all have to admit that if you're just going to play the card of People don't like you because you're too nice, or you're too free, or you're too fun-loving, or you're too gentle, or you're too lovable. 
they do have another thing coming because I don't think that that's true at all. The reason why people are responding to this person in a negative way is because that type of behavior is annoying. And I, I had to learn this the hard way because it wasn't until I was 23 years old that I really experienced someone kind of making unwanted advances onto me. And I had to ultimately learn that unreturned social affection is creepy. Absolutely. When someone is making gestures towards you or behaviors towards you, then, and you don't want them to, or you don't feel exactly what they feel, even if it's just trying to talk to you a lot, and uh, someone is trying to have long, extended, personal conversations with you, and you don't want to do that, that can really bother some people, and it can really create a very destructive type of outcome, because, again, firstly, someone is recognizing that this is a very agreeable person, they will tolerate them, then they will get on their nerves, and then they will just explode. And you should never explode on someone. But this goes to show you that conventional forms of being nice aren't always acceptable, and they aren't always truly welcome. Dr. Robert Glover talks about this a lot. He's the author of No More Mr. Nice Guys, Well, It's Dating Essentials for Men. And he openly points out that the concept of gift-giving is viewed as conventionally nice by some people. But if you're giving gifts for an inappropriate reason or an unscheduled reason, let's use that word, unscheduled rather than inappropriate, it can really bother people because it creates this type of creepiness. Yeah, birthday gifts are fine. Yes, Christmas gifts are fine. But when you give a gift to somebody just to be nice, it confuses them because you truly have to ask yourself, well, then why are you doing it? And um, we could talk for probably three hours about how being nice can actually bother people because um, I talk very frequently about how I follow the channel Oak Leaves and Onions, and the host of that one is anonymous. But uh, she said that nice guy behavior can be toxic, and it applies to women too. It's just um, from her perspective as a heterosexual woman dealing with nice guys, it can be toxic because the person usually has an end goal in mind. The person usually has a particular type of desire that they are trying to achieve, and they might not be approaching it in the most... Um, direct and the most honest and even the fairest type of way because the analysis that was shared on that channel is that nice guys think that they're having long meaningful conversations with someone but they're just using it as an opportunity to get sex whereas maybe a conventionally nice woman who is um, not very outgoing would uh, go after a guy that isn't interested in her and do the conventionally nice things, give compliments, buy him a gift or something like that, and she's just trying to get attention or trying to get a particular type of um, response from him. Maybe she wants a relationship and he does not, and this is where nice people overstep the boundaries, where they show absolute blatant disregard for the other person. And they do not take no for an answer, which is quite shocking from nice people, but they don't. They don't accept no. It's like, hey, look, I'm not looking for a relationship right now. And that the way that a nice person processes it in their brain is they're thinking, well, if I just show them how much I care, then they're going to reward me with a relationship. And they're going to do what I want if I just keep doing what I want. And why wouldn't they want this? Well, of course they want it. It's conventionally nice behavior. We did those activities in the fourth grade when they told us how to be nice. The K-12 through system in the United States is so bad. I cannot stress that enough. And um, I frequently talk about the book The Rational Male by Rollo Tomasi, who explores a lot of this when he talks about the gynocentric social order. And a boy goes to preschool or kindergarten, and almost always the teacher is a female. And the educational system conditions people 
to be this type of conventionally nice person, especially males, because the ideal male student for a kindergarten teacher or a first grade teacher or a second grade teacher is the boring nice guy. It is the um, someone who's polite and helpful and courteous and he shares what he has and he wants to volunteer. It's just conventionally nice behavior. What, what happens? Somebody turns 13 years old, 14 years old, now they have to enter the world of dating and those types of behaviors aren't attractive. Like, the reason why they condition people to behave like this in the K-12 system is because of the classrooms. It's easier for the teacher to manage a classroom when people are nice and polite and well-behaved, and they follow the rules, and they don't push boundaries, and they do the teacher's job for them. But once they get to teenage years, those types of behaviors aren't very desirable. So what actually happens is somebody is going to be, by somebody I mean, women in this exact example, is going to be attracted to someone who's going to create stimulation. You think I'm joking? You think I'm joking? And there's other theorists out there, like um, I've mentioned Dr. Robert Glover, he said that in a woman's 20s, like between the ages of really 18 to 29, she's going to experience the concept of emotional roller coastering, where she's going to be attracted to the extreme highs and the extreme lows with a partner. And men will not be experiencing this because men are overall attracted to physical appearances as opposed to stimulation, emotion, feeling. It is done more in a conscious level. Now here's another point we need to add to the list. How are people trying to manipulate you with logic, reason, and it's always their own self contrived logic, their own self-created logic, and their own self-created reason. What on earth am I talking about? Well, when somebody is simply saying that I want you to be in my life because I want you to, and guys will do this all the time with women, where they're going to be like, I'm looking at a woman. Not me, no, but some other guy is looking at a woman, and he is thinking, that he is going to be in a sexual relationship with her. Why? Well, he wants to, and he's not even making it as an emotional decision, and he's not even making it as a feeling decision. It's not anything to do with the way he feels toward the woman. Oh yeah, I recognize that she has conventionally attractive features, and I want her to be in a relationship with me. So I'm like, hey, do you want to come over tonight? And the only way, the only way that that would ever actually work is if the woman were already feeling a certain way. If she was already feeling a certain way, then she's going to respond in that way. But there's that absolute disconnect from emotions and feeling, just like trying to use logic and reason and not recognizing that there's some type of interconnection with emotions and feeling for human beings. I mean, empathy is not logical. No. I don't want to hear anybody just try and talk about humans are logical. Human beings are not logical. We're not. What does logic even tell you? Like, logic is, I don't have a dollar. Ah, but you have a dollar. Okay, so I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to take your dollar. Now I have a dollar. That's what logic is. And there's even uh, been some explanations. I don't remember the exact author of this essay, but I read it about uh, 14 years ago. Hmm, goodness. And he um, said that if you had something that was communal for the whole community, it is logical to take more than what you need. Because that's what logic is. Pluses and minuses. The exact example of what he, what he was talking about was having like a communal pasture for farmers where you got all these farmers who live near a town. Well then, the farmer should allow his flocks to graze excessively. Flocks, herds, flock of sheep, herd of um, cattle, whatever. They can graze excessively because they benefit from it. And they get more. You would get more if you did that. You would get a dollar if you killed somebody for a dollar. But the reason why you don't do that 
is not because of emotions, and it's not even because of the law. It's not even because of legality. Because then you could just say, oh, well, then it's okay to kill someone as long as I don't get caught. No, it's done because of fairness and empathy. It is unfair to kill somebody and take the dollar that belonged to them. And it is also unfair to try and violate someone else's life in an act of aggression purely for profit, and by doing so, showing absolutely no regard for the other person's well-being. Human beings in a civilized society do not live that way, so some people will still try to do that, like, a guy is looking at a woman, oh, she's single, and I find her conventionally attractive, therefore, she's going to be in a relationship with me. Absolutely not. People do not make decisions that way, or at the very least, women do not make decisions that way. And if I can give you some brutal honesty, if that guy's going to actually try to um, get into a situation with her, okay, not brutal honesty, but kind of the hard facts of life, he most likely won't even be able to get aroused because he's making the decision based on logic as opposed to genuine attraction. He doesn't actually feel anything. He's just doing this because it's what the expectation is. Yes, he might be attracted to her physically, but there's not going to be any type of stimulation that is going to be produced from these things called hormones in the body that is going to lead to any type of arousal. Maybe that's not brutal honesty, just the hard facts of life. Here is something, though, that maybe isn't even a point about manipulation. But I think that one thing that I've never heard anybody say, but it's very important, is social status and personality have no correlation. Social status and personality have no correlation. And this is important because people will just see somebody and they're off in the corner. Oh, look at that person sitting alone by themselves in the corner. I just want to be nice to him or her. Nope. Doesn't work like that. If you're... There's no way to predict that being nice to the person sitting alone in the corner is going to generate any particular type of result. Absolutely not. You think, oh, if I'm just nice to them, then they're going to be all happy and lovable. No. Sometimes you can be nice to the kid in the corner, and it turns out they're very mean. And it turns out that they're sitting by themselves because, well, no one really wants to tolerate their mean behavior. Or they can be mean in an introverted way that the reason why they're sitting by themselves is because they do not contribute to discussions and they just are very pessimistic and they bother people and they show absolutely no regard for the well-being of anybody else in the social circles. So there is no correlation between social status and personality. Another example of this is if somebody is going to try and be in a relationship with someone, or not even that, it's just about more like how conventionally nice people will seek relationships from someone, and if it's not returned, they might be a social pariah. They might not have a single friend. They might not have a single partner in their life. Oh, but now they're interacting with somebody. Now they're interacting with someone, they're just going to try and latch onto that person like a leech, showing absolute disregard for the person's well-being. No, no, I want you to stay with me. I want you to stay with me. Well, why should somebody stay with you? No other options. You're a social pariah, and you're just bothering people. But again, they're doing it with this type of disconnect from emotions and logic and it's not coming together at all. And once we begin to recognize that personality traits do not actually connect with a lot of the factors in human behavior, it really leads us to develop an understanding of how, he, how we are making our decisions. We don't have to choose only one. You can have emotions and you can have logic and they can all come together. And also, on that note, I think there's some other points that really need to be talked about, and that is that 
rough behavior can be its own manipulative, manipulative tactic. I was listening to an episode of uh, Rolo Tomasi's show, and he made a very bold statement that I don't agree with at all, when he said that when guys give each other a hard time, it's just about guys giving each other a hard time. There's no ill feeling. There's no ill will. No, there's, um, it, this is just what guys do, right? I've actually had somewhat of a disagreement with that over the last several years because I really began to recognize that it is a form of emotional trauma that is creating these types of desires for any type of mean behavior. And someone has experienced something bad or traumatic in their life that is driving them to create these types of rough-edged behaviors. Now, you want to talk about manipulation. You want to talk about manipulation tactics. I was listening to an episode of Playing With Fire, another YouTube uh, channel out here, and one guy brought up this challenge question. And he was talking about how it's acceptable to push boundaries with people. And you got two male friends, right? And one of them says to the other, Hey, let's go out tonight. And the other says, Uh, I don't want to. Then the other friend says, Ah, oh, come on, let's go out. Stop being a bitch. Is that acceptable? Is that acceptable behavior? I'm asking you right now. When somebody says, Let's go out tonight. Come on, stop being a bitch. And he's trying to use that as an example of how it's acceptable behavior for the exact same reason, as we said before, with the rational male. Yeah, when guys give each other a hard time, it's just guys giving each other a hard time. There's no ill will or ill feeling behind it. No. Would that guy say that in a group of other guys to someone who was the toughest guy in the group, who was bigger than him, who could beat the crap out of him? And if he knew... Now, there was even a 65% chance that that person was going to use physical force on him and he wouldn't be able to defend himself. Would he call that guy a bitch? No. The only reason why somebody would use that type of humor is because he thought there would not be consequences that he cared about. And this all goes back to the concept of emotional trauma. There's something that he feels has bad, that something bad has happened to him, and he's trying to recreate these destructive um, actions and behaviors into other people. And one thing that I think is so bizarre is some people genuinely enjoy recreating it. They think that's the reward of society. You want to talk about ways that people are trying to manipulate you? Imagine someone who has been at the bottom of the social order. Imagine someone who has just been borderline outcasted by everyone. And this person is now thinking, ah, people have been mean to me for a very long time. So what am I going to do? I'm going to wait until I'm a little bit higher on the social order. And then I'm going to be mean to people. That's the reward. They think that that's the reward, the reward and benefit of society. And I will never understand this. And I genuinely do mean that. In terms of personality... I absolutely do not function that way. It's really quite to the contrary. I'm because I'm mostly just and one of those people who tries to neutralize conflict, the whole smooth watered persona. But not everyone's like that. They really view it as a genuine benefit that they can create problems for somebody else. Now there is this channel out there called Free Domain Radio that has now been taken off of YouTube, the concept of deplatforming. And the host of that one, Stefan Molyneux, said a lot of ridiculous things, but he actually talked a lot about self-help and um, improving lifestyles. And what he said was that if someone is yelling at you, they don't care about you, because they will not do that when there are consequences. And I said that very same quotation to somebody else. If someone is, not, if someone is yelling at you, they don't care about you because they will not do that if there are consequences. And what that person said to me in response was, there were always consequences. So that's why I had to modify the statement. If someone is yelling at you, 
they don't care about you when there are consequences because they will not do that unless there are consequences that they care about. Because that's what it really is. Yes, of course, there are going to be some types of consequence. And as we said, if you tolerate, or if you um, abuse somebody's tolerance, eventually it will reach a breaking point where they will not want to stay with you. And ultimately, they will um, eventually leave the relationship. But the way that mean people function is... It really is somewhat of a mystery. Some mean people absolutely get devastated when you leave them. Other mean people don't care at all. They're like, oh, okay. But I would invite anyone to bring about a new way to rephrase that. If someone is yelling at you, they don't care about you because they will not do that when there are consequences that they care about. It's exactly the same as that playing with fire example about the guy who is insulting his... um friend saying, hey, come on, let's go out tonight. Stop being a bitch. And as I said, he would only do that if he were not threatened by the person, if he didn't believe that he would be punished for that. So that's why you cannot tolerate rough humor, even among friends, even among co-workers, even among relationships, because that's all that it is. It's just they aren't afraid of the consequences. There aren't consequences that they care about. And it really is a type of disrespect that is coming from some form of emotional trauma. Now, that same episode of Playing With Fire brought up a very good question about when is it acceptable to push people's boundaries? This should be another point of manipulation, how people are trying to manipulate you. When is it acceptable to push people's boundaries? And... These two guys are in this debate, and they're going back and forth about, you know, like, if somebody says no, can you still try to do what you want to do? And they're like, you're always violating the boundary. And one guy's like, yeah, you're always violating the boundary, but is it actually important? And somebody, in the wonderful comments section of YouTube, please leave any comments that you want here. One guy in the comments section of YouTube just simply said, I know what these guys are talking about, but they're not saying it. There are hard boundaries and there are soft boundaries. Like, um, a hard boundary would be if somebody is making an expression of disgust and raising their voice and um, showing outward displays of anger or um, someone is maybe even making a threat to call the police. Those would be hard boundaries. And in this, own pers this person's personal assessment, this guy's personal assessment, he simply said, no, you should never try to violate some of those, because that's when no means no. But if some people are saying it without those indicators, they are soft boundaries. And more or less, both guys were in somewhat of an agreement, but they didn't have the, that exact phraseology, that if people are exhibiting the concepts of soft boundaries, then people will still push against them. And even if, even if you do not accept that, some people don't want to admit that no means no, but that person does have a point. If you only set soft boundaries for yourself, people will not listen to them, exhibiting forms of um, responses that are not containing any type of expression of disgust or raising your voice or being firm and stern and being direct and clear. People are definitely going to push against them. But I shouldn't talk too much about that, because I had to have a very strong learning experience this year, and I ultimately had to have the uh, realization that some people just simply will not listen to you. If people do not respect you, they will not listen to you. If they just believe that there are some type of superior individual who doesn't have to follow the rules, they will not listen to you. And that person just needs to go in the trash can the emotional trash can of life. Why? Because they're not going to do anything. And you can listen to all the help, self-help strategies in the world. I can tell you all the self-help strategies in the world. It's not going to get through to them. They just need to be removed. If there's even one thing you don't like about someone, you can cut them out of your life. Right? Right? But um, some examples of this would be the self-help strategies that I was talking about. 
It comes uh, not only from Dr. Robert Glover, whom I previously mentioned, but Dr. Phil even talked about this a lot in his book Life Code. And I know Dr. Phil is just um, some type of TV host now. He uh, no longer has his license to practice psychology. I don't even really care about that, but just on a very quick side note, um, I followed a channel on YouTube called Barehanded Enterprises until I watched all of the videos, and he was talking about how the guy had a degree in uh, phys ed and health science, the host of that channel, and he said Dr. Phil put out a book on, um, like, phys ed and health science, and he's like, why is this guy putting out a book on this subject? I mean, he's a psychologist, and, you know, he's talking about phys ed and health science, and he thought that he was going to hate the book, but then he read it, and he was like, oh, wow, it actually wasn't so bad. That's the way I responded to the book Life Code by Dr. Phil. I thought that I was going to hate it, and it was going to be silly and ridiculous, it wasn't really so bad, because it actually had a few points in there that I thought were rather valuable. The first one is that you can have boundaries for people. And again, I'm partnering this with some stuff from Dr. Robert Glover. Number one, make the rules for your partner and introduce them as rules. Not just, I don't, I, I, I don't like it when you do that. That's when you need to listen to Free Domain Radio. They know you don't like it when they're doing that. They don't care. They're doing it anyway. Make the rules for your partner. And this is the life code stuff. Introduce something that is called the ultimatum with options. Put the options on the table. If you do that again, then this will happen. If you do that again, I will respond in this way. If you do that again, this type of privilege that you have in our relationship will not exist anymore. Ah, it sounds so good, right? Make the rules and then enforce the consequences when they don't follow your rules, right? I tried that once, and exactly, exactly like that. And it worked, and I'm like, oh yeah, I got this now. I'm like a tough alpha dog, right, right? No, uh-uh. Second time, I tried that strategy with a different person. They didn't care at all. No matter how direct you are, no matter how focused you are, no matter what type of rule you put on the table, no matter what you say to the person, if they don't care about you, they aren't going to listen to your rules. If they don't respect you, they're not going to listen to your rules then that's just it. That's just it. And that person needs to go in the trash can. Don't think about them. Think about you. They're not respecting you. What do you possibly need from them? Some type of emotional passion and desire that you're trying to recreate that never actually was there. That person just needs to be cut out of your life. And a lot of people will not do that. A lot of people are simply trying to go after individuals whom they think are not good for them, but they view it as a particular type of conquest. And this is the way that the nice people use that manipulation tactic that I was talking about earlier. They're looking at this person like, oh yeah, here's my chance now, here's my chance for a conventional relationship, which I don't have access to because no one wants to tolerate my detachment from reality, and just perhaps lack of sexual availability, Let's not kid ourselves, that's there too. And then they see someone and they think, oh, this person's being sensitive to my advances, now is my opportunity to lock them down in a relationship. And then they show absolute blatant disregard for the person. They're just viewing them as a conquest, and it's dehumanizing, and it's objectification. It's treating a human being as an object or a number or just uh, something that has to be achieved and obtained. And that is some very dangerous stuff, because you might be thinking, oh, somebody wants to be in a relationship with somebody else just because they want someone. Yeah, you're okay, you're treating somebody as a number, but big deal. But what are the long-term consequences of that? What that leads to is stuff like Giovanni Gian Maria Ortes, the um, Italian philosopher who was all about turning aspects of the human body into numbers, that the human body has nothing special about it. Human beings have nothing special about them. They're just bone, tendon, ligament, 
and muscle. That's all human beings are. And once you begin to try and treat people as numbers, it leads to disastrous things, because then you don't have to care if they live or die. By the time you get to the 20th century, you experience Frederick Winslow Taylor and the principles of scientific management, who partnered closely with Henry Ford and the assembly line. How do we make the production facility work faster? Create a revolving door of production by treating people as numbers. It's exactly um, the same concept. It's just done in somewhat of a more aggressive way. So there are very, very big long-term consequences that people care about because it leads to dehumanization. And as a fundamental rule, we should not do anything that diminishes the magnificence of the human essence. Can we just say that in conclusion? You are awesome. There's something awesome about you. Even if you're a demented sociopath listening to this, which I know you're not because sociopaths don't listen to Astro Psych 400. No, they're off doing other things. But there's still something human about you. But that's why I like you. Whoever has found it, whoever reached this part of the 44-minute mark on this episode, you are awesome. And keep being awesome. So I think that that's where we're going to have to end the episode for now. Thank you so much to anyone who has found this far off corner of YouTube. You can always like, subscribe, weigh in in the comments section down below, and share your own experiences with manipulation and the different types of manipulation. I want to know what you think and um, how these things have affected your life. Please say anything that you want, and you can always visit my other channel, Black Box Online Radio, which comes to you at least three times a week talking about the Zodiac Killer, lately about the Phantom Killer and the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, and Friday isn't Anything Goes or any subject is fair game. And there have been a lot of breaking news stories in the true crime world. So, I have this um, page on Instagram called BlackBoxNet88, you can follow too. And I say, everybody stay safe, fairness, and empathy. And on Black Box Online Radio, I don't have... I don't know, on Black Box Online Radio, I always say, until next time. But um, here on Astro Psych 400, I'm going to have to get a better sign-off, because Astro Psych 400 is also the home of the podcast for sleep which helps people fall asleep at night. Some people were saying that um, they use Black Box Online Radio for that purpose, but for me, um, I decided to try and launch the podcast for sleep here on Astro Psych 400. And for that one, I just say good night because it's the podcast for sleep. Astro Psych 400, podcast for sleep. It's time to fall asleep now. Time to surround yourself with positive vibes. You are who you are. Being weird is not a crime. And that one comes out on the weekends, whenever I have time, either on Saturday or Sunday nights, usually that is released. But, you know, there's a lot of content here on YouTube that you can explore, and um, feel free to uh, hop around, look through some things. If you like what you hear, you can always share with your friends and family. And I will see you over on BlackBoxNet88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Fairness and empathy, until next time. Let's think about a particular way that I can sign off from the channel, Astrocyte 400. But see you in the future. How about that one?